Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 336. Today we welcome back Jared Casey. Jared Casey is professor of philosophy at University College Dublin. He's the author of numerous books, most recently, Libertarian Anarchy Against the State. And today I wanted to talk to him about the history of political thought from a libertarian perspective. We're going to talk about the 16th through the 18th centuries, if we can go really, really fast. So fast, indeed, that I'm going to turn things over right now to my conversation with Professor Casey. And, of course, remember the show notes page for today will be tomwoods.com slash 336. Here we go. I always spend a little time before talking to somebody, going over what I'm going to ask about, what the subject matter is, if the person has written a book recently, I make sure to read it, all these sorts of things. Well, this time in having you on, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the themes that are raised in this course that you produced for Liberty Classroom, the second part of your history of political thought. And as I'm looking it over, and of course I've looked at it many times, but as I'm looking it over, I thought, this is ridiculous, no way I could do this in one one visit to the show from you, so we'll see what we can do. I'm going to pick out things that seem interesting to me and that I think are important for libertarians to understand. This course of yours goes from the Huguenots, so we're talking about the 16th century here, all the way to the present. And in fact, the course icon, the image that we have that people click on to reach the course at libertyclassroom.com is Lysander Spooner, who is not a figure who normally <laughs> will come up in a course like this. All right, let's talk first of all about the modern idea of sovereignty, because that is one of the bookends of this course. Yep, right, that's far away. So explain what Somebody like Jean Baudin or really any of these early theorists, Thomas Hobbes, what do they mean by sovereignty? And is this simply a uh, gloss on an existing concept or is it an altogether new concept? Uh, I suppose the answer to that is it's a little bit of both. Um, it's a concept. It's an idea that had been emerging uh, through the later Middle Ages. But Baudin was the person who, if you like, gave it the focus that it now has. And the idea was that uh, up to then, um, there was really no idea that uh, in any particular state or political or political grouping, that one person or one body had to be, if you like, in total control. And what Boda argued was that a state couldn't be a state unless there was a single person or a single body who exercised, in principle at least, uh, total control over every aspect of what went on in that state. And that's a new idea. And we can contrast that then with somebody like a figure you mentioned. In fact, you've got the subheading as the road not taken, Johannes Althusius. I bet I would say, you know, the average American certainly has never heard of Johannes Althusius. And I bet even some <laughs> of my listeners are not familiar with him. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say nobody's heard nobody's of him. heard of him. I know even the good guys have heard, have not heard of him. I've written a no, little bit about him, but I heard of yeah. him only you know sort of on a lark. I, I happened to hear a lecture by Don Livingston, and he mentioned Althusius, so I went and read him, and I found him quite interesting. How was Althusius a contrast to these modern apostles of sovereignty? Well, just before I answer that, I mean, I, I think a sort of the general point about history here is that history, when it's written, you're a historian, you probably know this. I mean, general histories tend to take a sort of straight line through what is a very complicated and multifaceted reality. And so when when people are doing uh, political history, they tend to see blah, 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 and inevitably Boda emerges and then everything goes on from there. Right. But of course, he was only one among many. And Althusius was in his time although slightly later, a sort of, he proposed a rival conception, or rather, should I say, he accepts the same concept of sovereignty, but he locates it differently. He doesn't locate it. See, Boda locates the notion of sovereignty in the ruler, but Boda uh, locates it in the people and in the people corporately, not in the ruler. And this is a very different uh, idea. And it's an idea which, if it had been taken seriously, uh, and incorporated in political reality would have changed probably the course of European and indeed uh, American history. And of course, what emerges out of Althusius is a variegated political order of 
families and households, households which can then group together to form villages, and villages can form provinces, and provinces can form provincial councils, and you just go on and on, up and up and up to higher and higher levels. So the idea being that each of these has an independent existence of its own, is not a creation of the state, precedes the state, and has liberties that are prior to the state. This is exactly the opposite of the message that we get from Hobbes. Oh, indeed. Well, what's really interesting about Boda is, well, well, a number of things. First of all, uh, he could be described as a federalist, not in the U.S. sense of that term, but in the sense that um, you have, as, as you've just said, individuals coming together in families and families to, in, you know, local associations and then cities and so on and so forth. And the whole idea is that each of these groups mirrors in its structure uh, what goes on in the other groups. So there's an horizontal connection between the individuals. And in each case, these individuals agree to setting up, if you like, an executive for to serve their own purposes. What's very interesting about Buddha is that in each of these cases, uh, the people, the horizontal level, they are the principal. And the ruler is only the agent. He's their agent. Well, it's very important, right? Uh, rather than it being the case for Bodin that the that the sovereign is the principal, if you like, and the people, the agent, gets uh, things entirely the other way around. Um, and so we, uh, you have on these various levels the same structure mirrored all the way through. Now, I, I mean, it would be too much to say that Althusius was a, a, a sort of proto-libertarian uh, or proto-anarchist, uh, but certainly his conception of order is something that I think, if suitably modified and developed, would be something that uh, anarchists would, I think, in principle, be prepared to accept and to work with. Well, speaking of that, you have here Hugo Grotius, whom I do not think would typically be covered in a course like this. Uh, I think people would think of him as a just war theorist, and maybe they know that he did some work in natural rights and so on and so forth, but I'm not so sure how heavily he figures in, even though he no doubt deserves to. So I want to turn our attention to there. And of course, I remind listeners, we're talking about part two of a two-part series. It's the second course that Professor Casey has done for us on the history of political thought at libertyclassroom.com. Of course, you guys who listen to the show can get a discount over there using coupon code SHOW in all caps. You can ask Professor Casey questions. You can take this course while you're driving around. All kinds of wonderful resources for you. It's the education we all should have gotten but never did. So Hugo Grotius, we know of because he and some some of the Spanish scholastics concurrently worked on just war theory. But there's more to Hugo Grotius than just that, although you do mention that. Yes, indeed. Um, he really, I suppose, to some extent, is often taken to be the sort of the father of international law. Now, I, I slightly dispute that in my account. I argue that to some extent, as the result, one of the deleterious results of the Reformation was the split between North and South Europe. And the the kind of uh, that Grotius gets credit to some extent for work which had already been done uh, by his Spanish predecessors and indeed uh, Spanish contemporaries. Um, but once you have a situation arising, as happened in Europe after the uh, religious um, uh, fracturing of Christendom, um, you have to you have to work out how individual states are going to relate. Law is no longer just a matter of what happens within a state, but since each state is, as it were, an empire in itself, um, what, if anything, is going to be the way in which they relate? Do they relate as sort of proto-Hobbesian individuals who are going to be permanently in the state of war with each other, not necessarily a conflict, not necessarily fighting and so on, but if you like being ready to fight at a moment's notice? Or are they some principles which govern their relations? And so Grotius was the first one, if you like, and he, or sorry, the, probably the most prominent person to work out some kind of theory of international law. Uh, and this is very important. If anyone's had the misfortune to read uh, Grotius's Rights of War and Peace, you realize it's, an, it's a 2,000-page uh, treatise, which is exhaustive and exhausting. I mean, what, what it, the downside for Grotius is that in some ways he, uh, he's retrograde. And his, his account of sovereignty, though largely a kind of Bodinian conception of sovereignty, is actually confused and very confusing. And a lot of that, if you like, passes into uh, later thought and indeed up to the present day, causing similar confusions. 
Let's jump ahead. Of course, in the course itself, you would spend a substantial amount of time on each one of these thinkers, but I want to give people at least a sampling of at least the beginning topics. And I'm interested in the English Revolution, the English Civil War period, because there you get the appearance of a group of people known as the Levelers. And based on their name, of course, there's been a lot of confusion over the years. People no doubt think when they hear levelers, these must be radical egalitarians. But in fact, it was the diggers who were the radical egalitarians. The levelers were perhaps egalitarian in a functional sense that uh, you know no one should be able to lord it over other people. But talk about the levelers and their significance in the history of thought. Rothbard was a big fan of the levelers. Yeah, I, in fact, I think that um, this period of the English Revolution, uh, the what happened in England between, say, 1635-1640 and, and the Restoration in 1660, I beg your pardon, is hugely significant. Um, it is the, the first time, I think, in history, uh, it's certainly in the history of the West, where, if you like, a genuine, genuinely popular movement um, almost achieved political prominence. Um, the positions taken by the levelers would not now seem extraordinary. They were looking for, if you like, uh, uh, representation for all uh, people, a people being able to vote and have a say in what happened to them, uh, universal suffrage of some kind, at least limited universal male suffrage, and so on and so forth. Um, without necessarily re requiring or demanding, if you like, a, a fundamental uh, redistribution of property. Um, this was the main difference between them and, and the diggers. Um, the dispute, uh, th this came uh, in, in, the, in the course, I point to the Putney debates, which was an extraordinary event, uh, one that I think doesn't get anything like the attention it deserves, an extraordinary event in history where the, the lower ranks in the, in the victorious parliamentary army uh, managed to get uh, the attention, if you like, of their leaders, including Cromwell and his son-in-law, uh, Ireton, um, to take seriously their proposals so that th this, these discussions were going on. And there was a real possibility that change would have taken place in the, in the event. Uh, sorry, as it happens, they were overtaken by events so that the uh, leveler position, if you like, receded. The discussion in the Putney debate was very interesting because uh, Ireton, who was uh, Cromwell's son-in-law, pointed out that, in fact, even though the levelers may not have cl claimed not to be in favor of a widespread redistribution of property, a consequence, a logical consequence of their position was that this is what it implied, right? Very interestingly. Uh, and the, the so unfortunately, as I said, because of the events that took place, uh, the escape of the king and, and so on, uh, the discussions hung fire and so things didn't proceed. But this was a usually significant moment in history, if you like, another road in a way that was not taken. Well, by the time we get to the end of the 17th century, we've got John Locke and Rothbard. I remember, I don't remember where he said it, but at one point Rothbard said, John Locke is one of these cases in which the conventional wisdom is correct, that he was an important classical liberal, because his uh, Rothbard's view is that a lot of historians get a lot of things wrong, like they totally <laughs> mischaracterized John Stuart Mill, for example, but they more or less got John Locke right. There are some outliers who try to interpret Locke in uh, ridiculous ways, but basically he is a, an important classical liberal thinker, and the culmination of what the levelers were groping toward and what some of the late scholastic uh, natural rights theorists were groping toward. Give us the, the good in Locke, and then maybe we might talk a little bit about what you consider to be the confused in Locke <laughs> okay. as a political well, theorist. As a political theorist, well, what, okay, you have to see Locke, I suppose, to some extent in contrast to Hobbes and their different, the different positions they take in relation to what they conceive of as, of as being man's, the state of nature in which human beings live. Hobbes notoriously sees uh, man as being in a permanent state of war with other uh, human beings. And he doesn't think that there is any law in nature prior to whatever is set up by convention once we've established, if you like, political society. Hob uh, Locke, on the other hand, thinks that even in the state of nature, there are laws that obtain, right? And there, so the reasons for moving, if you like, simply from society to a political society are because of what he regards as the inconveniences of nature. Uh, not not least of which is the fact that he thinks that in, in the state of nature, each man is a judge in his own case. And therefore, 
there is a danger, if you like, that that violence uh, will break out because people will not be able to resolve their differences peacefully. Uh, so that is the strong thing. The other thing is he is, um, although perhaps at times ambiguous, he is one of the first, I think I'm correct in saying this, he is one of the first to pay serious attention to the relationship of property to uh, a political thought. Harrington, uh, at the, in the, at the, during the period we've just been talking about, at the end of the Civil War, um, had actually thought about it as well. But Hobbes, I, I beg your pardon, Locke was probably the person who brought it uh, into general consideration. And uh, he, so Locke, Locke's account of property, how it's acquired uh, and, and what belongs to it and, and, and so on, um, this, is, this is going to be foundational, if you like, for all political theory from this point on, whether you agree with him or disagree with him. Uh, any political thinker after Locke has to take account of his account of property. And that property begins with a property in his own person. Those are Locke's yes. words. So there, so is it, I mean, this is not the very first time that this idea has been talked about. The Levellers made reference to a property in one's own person, but what does Locke then do with that idea? Well, as as you say, uh, there have been anticipations of it uh, pr- uh, prior to Locke, but Locke is probably the, one of the clearest exponents of this, right? And he he thinks that every man possesses a natural right to life, liberty. And the state, words which are echoed almost word for word, of course, in uh, in American significant documents, except that the state becomes something else. Uh, and that there is a connection between our natural rights to life, liberty and a state and that each man's property rights then in external things derives ultimately from his property right in himself and his labor. In other words, it's because we own ourselves in a significant sense that we can come to own things other than ourselves. And there has to be a connection between these. He talks about uh, private property as something that flows from the property that we enjoy in ourselves. And he talks about mixing one's labor with previously unowned goods or goods that are that have not that don't have any individual property title attached to them and that this renders the thing yours. And I know that you have said, and you're not alone in this, that there is a kind of confusion in his idea of the mixture of labor and with the idea that uh, if I mix the labor with something, this makes it mine, because that opens you up to the Robert, uh, uh, Robert Nozick objection that if I pour a can of tomato juice into the Atlantic Ocean, that doesn't mean I own the Atlantic Ocean. I remember that when we've talked about this in the past, you added an important clarifying note to all this. Yeah, um, the, the I think the the image of the mixing of labor is uh, is obviously a very important and historically a very important image. The trouble is, it's taken from a limited case, uh, a limited set of cases in which we come to acquire property. It would be, for example, the situation where you you took some clay and you shaped it into a particular form and then and then fired it and made a cup or a bowl. Um, but that's only one way in which we can... The trouble is, if you take that as being somehow constitutive of what property is in all cases, you're going, in run, you're going to run into difficulties. For example, um, if you put a fence around a field, in what sense have you mixed your labor with the entire field? You certainly have mixed your labor with the portion of the ground into which you have driven the stakes holding up the fence, but you haven't actually done anything else to the field. So it, it can't be a complete account. What Locke is really talking about is a notion of the, 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 which was dominant at that period and, and later, the notion of improvement. The idea that if you do something or make use of things in a certain way to improve them, to improve their productivity uh, primarily for Locke, in other words, to make them more productive, um, transform them in some way, and there are a range of ways in which you can transform them, one of which is by mixing your labor with it, in, as in the case of the clay, but not in all cases, then you have established a claim to the ownership uh, of that thing in a way that others, other people who come after you do not. And he envisages a situation in which uh, there are first comers, as it were, and the first comer ha- takes priority in this case. And one of the ways it, you take priority is you have the right to exclude uh, those who come after you. Um, from the use of that property. Now, Locke, of course, foresees a situation where uh, 
when you start off in the situation, there's going to be plenty of resources left for everybody else so that other people will inevitably be left in a situation where they won't be substantially made worse off by your acquisition of property. However, the problem arises eventually that eventually all significant natural resources have been appropriated and they're still going to be, if you like, latecomers. What do you do then? Right. And that's where his notorious provisos uh, come in. So the, the second proviso was that you're entitled to, if you like, take property into your own ownership if you leave enough and is good for everybody else. Now, Locke's way out of this, and it's not entirely satisfactory, but you can see why he's going in this direction, is to say that once somebody makes takes property into, into, into their ownership, uh, the, the productivity increases enormously. So that land that is unimproved is uh, is quite unproductive. But land that is improved, if you like, he thinks produces something like a hundredfold uh, in terms of what it would have done before. And in that sense, um, even though I, I as an owner have taken something from from the common stock, nonetheless, because of my productivity, I have made many, many, many times more available to everybody than would have been the case had I not done so, so that he thinks in those cases the proviso will in fact be observed. Yeah, I was going to uh, ask you about that, and I know that Rothbard didn't think much of, of uh, Locke's proviso, and he said that the introduction of money in, to some degree solves the problem, because for one thing you don't have the problem of spoilage, because you now you have the easier prospect of facilitating exchange. Yes. Yeah. The uh, lock, Well, uh, the proviso we've been talking about is the second one. The first one was, of course, that you had a right only to take as much as w- and, and to keep it, but not allow it to spoil. So the idea, the image here was that, for example, if you were to come across, let's say, um, a, a grove of apple trees growing naturally, you couldn't, as it were, grab all the apples and sort of, you know, put them in a in a in a in a bin and then you know, eat five or six and allow the rest to rot. Locke thought there was something seriously wrong with that. But of course, once you, once money is invented, right, then your use of natural resources is not uh, confined to your own particular use so that you don't have to eat all the apples. You can, of course, trade them to somebody else for money. Um, And in that case, uh, since the money normally is something like gold or silver, precious metal or jewels or something, then, of course, that can be uh, maintained and there is no danger of spoilage. Um, that's his way out of that particular problem. It's a funny one to start with, right? I would have, so no, nobody really pays a lot of attention to that. Um, although, in a sense, it, it, Locke, because Locke was an economist as well, and, uh, but he doesn't make much use of the notion of money or, or its origin uh, or, or indeed its functions, apart from the ones we just mentioned, in the, in, his, in the context of his political philosophy. But he does mention it as the first proviso. But the one that has attracted all the attention is, of course, the uh, second proviso. And, of course, uh, some form or other of this, uh, I, mean, I think people should know, continue, uh, continues to this day so that uh, Nozick, if you like, uh, pays attention to it in, in Anarchy State and Utopia. And the so-called left libertarians, that would be Michael Michael Otsuka um, uh, and others, those people who are working, if you like, who are libertarians in the sense that they take liberty as a preeminent uh, political uh, value, but nonetheless believe that this is consistent with some kind of egalitarian distribution of primary resources. They continue to pay attention to something like some form of a Lockean second proviso. You know, I know we're coming up on the limits of time here, but I just can't help it. As long as we're galloping through political thought, there's one <laughs> more person I want to bring up because I find him utterly maddening, and yet you can't avoid him. You have to talk about him. That's Jean Jacques Rousseau. <laughs> I mean, the, why did I? Why did I suspect yeah, exactly, you? Were yeah, you knew exactly so. which person I had in mind. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to. I'd really like to talk about the discourses and the social contract, and of course I know that every professor in the world would be appalled that we would try to do this quickly, but the discourses, I think what people walk away from is his idea that institutions are corrupting and that man in his natural state is uh, is noble. Now, is, is that a caricature or is that roughly what he's saying? It's, it's, it's partially true. In fact, uh, Rousseau's uh, conception of what a human being is in the discourses is very peculiar. Somebody described it uh, that man for Rousseau is sort of like an amiable ape. (laughs) In other words, he's like the sort of uh, uh, ape that sort of wanders around benignly, 
uh, uh, you know, he's not he's not actually in a sense a, really a moral being at all. He's not the, he's not either bad or good because he's not a moral being. He, on you know, just as for example, if your dog bites you, you don't normally reprehend it morally. Okay, dogs biting you is just dog biting you. But so so the human being for Russo is very very peculiar. Uh, he's he's gifted with a desire for self-preservation on the one hand, but then has a sort of equally native propensity to feel pity for others and sort of sort of ambles around the world in this kind of pre-human. It's almost like a pre-human stage. It's like a stage of of Edenic innocence. All right. But without rationality, in, in effect, it's a very peculiar idea. How does property enter into all this? Oh, proper. <laughs> well, for, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> property for Rousseau is the bad. Property is the snake in the Garden of Eden. All right. We were doing just fine. OK. Until some smart guy got the idea of claiming these are more or less Rousseau's words, but slightly phrased differently of claiming this is mine. OK. And excluding others. And from that moment, Rousseau thinks, OK, we've been in trouble. Um, so in a way, what he what he's doing, I mean, this is his story, but you can get a slightly more sophisticated version. And indeed, there are contemporaries who write in this particular way um, that the one of the causes of social evil, social political evil has, in fact, has to be traced back to the first agricultural revolution in the in the Neolithic uh, age, and it was the um, it is human beings settling down and producing uh, goods in excess, which allowed, if you like, the rise of political and social inequality, uh, from which we have suffered ever since. So Rousseau is giving us an early version of this idea. Let's talk in- instead about uh, the social contract for a moment, then, uh, because th- th- it's tricky to get a grip on exactly what he means by his concept of the general will. Because he, I think here what he's struggling with, it seems to me, is the Enlightenment's uh, discomfort with the idea of authority, the idea that one person is going to tell somebody else what to do. They have to somehow, they know that at some point in society, somebody does have to give commands, so they have to... Yeah make it seem as if the command is really emerging from you. It's really you commanding yourself. So it's not like things were in the bad old days when the king told you what to do. This is really you telling you what to do. You know, I often think that, okay, you're right, it's a very mystifying idea. It's I often think that it's sort of Rousseau's version of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of strange, right? Uh, first of all, the general will, you might, you, a reader thinking, reading this for the first time, might think that what he means here is something like the democratic consensus. Right. Yeah, and it's not. In, in a society. Right? And he's not talking about this at all. In fact, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a mystery, right? I don't quite want to, it's, it's his attempt really to capture the idea that a community has a personality of its own, which is not the personality of any of its members, nor is it, if you like, the, the, the sum of the goods of its members or a kind of a community personality. Um, and so this sort of transcendent will, if you like, embodies the whole spirit of the community. One way to think of it, I suppose, is to think of the uh, of the body politic as being the state, right? And the general will, to some extent, is an aspect of the sort of state's soul. It's just like just like a human being has has a soul and will and intellect and so on. So the the body politic, if you like, has a will, and that will is a unitary will of the unitary body politic, not to be reduced simply to the uh, individual wills of its constituent parts. This is a this is a kind of mysterious notion to put it mildly, right? I mean, how do you know what it is? For example, how uh, is it enough? For example, that I mean, how how would you know when the general will is speaking to you? How do you know what is actually commanding you to do, right? And in fact, curiously enough, Rousseau then introduces and even just to make the mysterious even more mysterious, he introduces the figure of the so-called legislator with a capital L, right? This legislator. If you like, is sort of a bit like the 18th century Deus Ex Machina, you know, the god in the machine who sort of swoops down to solve the problems. And when individuals are sort of arguing and get their story together, he is the one who appears to sort of sort things out. A bit like the sheriff in a Western, right? It's really strange stuff. It's it's something, it's an idea that uh, Bastiat objected to strenuously. Anytime he comes across a thinker who 
conceives of the legislator as someone who takes the raw material of the people and forges them into something, makes them into a people with a capital P, this terrifies him. This is this is totalitarianism ultimately. Now when we when we talk about this general will, the idea is that the state will operate according to the general will. And that when we try to figure out what the general will is, the idea is that we try to think of what the will of the collective would be if we could abstract out any 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 self interest that you might have, any selfish interest that yeah. you might have, you put that to to the side, and people will have interests in both directions. They'll cancel. They'll cancel out, and the rest, what is remaining, will be the general will as people are responsibly thinking about what is best for the population as a whole. And then, if the resulting law is something that you perceive as as oppressing you, well, it's not oppressing you because it really is your will. And if you say, but I objected to it, then the answer would have to be, well, that's because you weren't thinking clearly or you were thinking only in terms of your own individual well-being. If you were thinking clearly, you would see that this is the general will and it's not an imposition on you. It liberates you because it really is your own unfiltered will. Yeah, you, you you put your finger on it. I mean, this is a really, really important point. OK, and it, it doesn't it's not just purely historical. It doesn't just live and die with Rousseau. But this idea that somehow the the general will will is the expression of what is really and truly good for you as a thing from what you might in your ignorance think is good for you. Right. Finds expression, for example, in Kant, in Hegel and in Marx and in, and in Rawls. And even to some extent in Burke. And one sort of one very common version of this is the sort of Marxist uh, idea of false consciousness. OK, you find this, you know, this is a rampant oh, idea, yeah. of course, in a postmodern world. And the idea, uh, for example, you might. OK, let's suppose we were talking about feminism and there are different forms of feminism. And you and some and some uh, radical feminist is arguing that women really want something. You say, well, lots of women don't or don't appear to or in fact some of them explicitly say that and then they will say yes but that's because they don't they don't they are indoctrinated or they don't really know or they're they are prisoners of a false consciousness and if they were only to know what is really in their good they would desire now you get this kind of counterfactual uh, undermining of people's actual inclinations or their actual desires uh, in favor of some hypothetical one. And here the thing is, how come, I always want to know, how come you know, okay, what is truly good for me, what is truly good and fulfilling? And uh, and of course, the man in the street, and this is the point I've brought up against Rousseau and others, is why is it that if I want something, and I really do. And I know that I want it and I've thought about it and reflected on it. And no nonetheless, you have the right to come along and say to me, well, look, really, you're deluded. If you really knew what was good for you, OK, you would choose this. And what is this most reminiscent of? Well, it's most reminiscent of the relationship that obtains between parents and very young children, where where parents have the responsibility to see that the, the children don't kill themselves. OK, and where we intervene to override a child's choice when we believe on the basis of our experience and indeed on the basis of our responsibility for them, that they are not entitled to do certain things until they reach a certain age. And so what Rousseau has done is to institutionalize, if you like, this form of paternalism. And so we see this echoing down the halls of history all the way from Rousseau, as I say, through Hegel, even through Burke, uh, Kant, and all the way through Marx and down to the present. It's it, it's with us. We'll probably never get rid of it. It's a germ. Before I let you go, give us a 60-second uh, pitch for your book, Libertarian Anarchy Against the State. I will make sure and link to, in the show notes page, on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 336, I'll link to the episode in which you came and talked about that book. I think that was all the way in episode 117, if I'm remembering this correctly. But this is tomwoods.com slash 336. Tell us about that book. Okay, well, this to some extent is meant to be uh, uh, both an introduction to the idea of libertarian anarchism on the one hand for people who don't know anything about it, and then also an attempt to try and introduce um, some more difficult themes. So I kind of start with a history and work my way through and then go through the idea, uh, the idea that law can be produced without a state. And finally, I attack 
uh, one or two of the basic arguments that are used to justify the state in the end. I don't answer all the questions. I probably raise more questions than I answer. But I think anybody reading it uh, who isn't a libertarian, even if they aren't a libertarian when they finish it, will at least have their faith shaken to some extent. Right. I, I can testify to that. I've heard some uh, some great uh, testimonials from people who went into it without an axe to grind on either side and came out on the other side very intrigued. And of course, I love the book and have been urging people to read it. So, uh, Professor Casey, thanks for your time. It's uh, it, basically it's crying out. The audience is crying out for more. So we'll have to uh, have you back on soon. Very good. Thank you much, Tom. All right, everybody. If you've been putting it off, now's a great time to join us over at Liberty Classroom. Ask Professor Casey all the questions you want. Over at libertyclassroom.com, don't forget to use coupon code SHOW in all caps for a discount. Tomorrow we talk to Jim Otteson, author of the new book, The End of Socialism. Great stuff, that. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening. The Tom Woods Show.